We are, amen. Have a word of prayer and get into our lesson today. Father, as we study your word, Lord, let us study it not as the word of man, but as it is the word of God, speaking to us, our Heavenly Father, from a much higher level than man. The word is ever alive, it's living. Our Heavenly Father, open our hearts to receive it first in our heart. Then our Heavenly Father, illuminate our mind that we may understand with wisdom. God, prepare us to receive the truth. Then once we know it, Lord, let us act upon it. Our Heavenly Father, we pray in Jesus' name. You promise that if we lack wisdom, let us ask of God. I ask for that wisdom today, Heavenly Father. Not the wisdom of this world, nor of mankind, but thy wisdom. In Jesus' name we pray, and amen. All right. We're going to get back to the doctrine of the new birth. If you turn to John chapter number 3 and verse 3, in the Holy Bible. John 3, 3, the scripture says, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, I should notice two specific, definite things involved in this verse. Number one is the new birth, and number two, what it qualifies you for. It says that you can't even see the kingdom of God without the new birth. Now, the new birth is not the instrument of man. It's not man's ability to birth you or to born you or to have anything to do with the new birth. The new birth is of God. It is a spiritual birth. It is a supernatural birth. It defies all of the laws of mankind because it originates from God. It's not something the church can give you. It's not something religion can give you. It's not something that someone, someone can lead you into. It comes only from God, the new birth. The new birth is the gift of God. Uh, salvation has been offered all through the Bible, from the book of Genesis all the way through the book of Revelation. But the new birth is an entirely new thing. When Jesus Christ said that in John chapter number 3, he was saying to Nicodemus, something is about to drastically change in the order of God's relationship with man. And when he did that, uh, Nicodemus, of course, was completely taken aback. He had, didn't have a clue what he was talking about. As far as salvation is concerned, why, Nicodemus was a Pharisee. That was, his, that was his point in life. That's what he lived for. He lived for salvation. That's what it was about with him. But when the Lord Jesus Christ said, Nicodemus, you must be born again, he didn't have a clue what he was talking about. So let's look at the essence of a man. The Apostle Paul said, I pray your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless to the coming of our Lord. That means that man is a tripart being, spirit, soul, and body. Three distinct words are used. And I'm going to give you just a little bit of refreshing and lead you into what we'll be studying today. The new birth, first of all, is how? You receive the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. The new birth, therefore, is dependent completely upon you receiving what God says about you. If you will accept what he says about you, what God says about you, not what the church says about you, not what man says about you, what God says about you. If you receive that, you receive the word, and the word itself is able to save your soul. The entrance of thy word. The second thing about the new birth is when. When, can the new, when does the new birth take place? Well, it was not in effect. It was not ratified, if you please. It was not uh, uh, legally brought about. It was not uh, efficacious until the death of the testator. Amen. Hebrews chapter number 9. So when the Lord Jesus Christ died, the new birth became a reality. And not until then. Amen. The Lord Jesus Christ being the second man, last Adam made the new birth available to mankind. And then the new birth, what? What is it? Well, the Bible says that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. The Bible nowhere ever says that the soul has been born again. The Bible says the soul is saved. Just like the Old Testament term constantly over and over and over again talks about salvation. But it's talking about the salvation of the soul. It's not talking about the new birth of the Spirit. It's never mentioned but it's talking about the salvation of the soul. 
The soul, as you know, is that part of you that is we commonly refer to as intellect, emotion, and will, the three aspects of your soul. The part of you that does thinking, responds to outside input. The part of you that has emotion, will, of course, is your volition. It's your ability to choose, to make choices, either good or bad. And so the soul is the part of you that uh, the old uh, Greek uh, philosophers had a lot to say about the soul. They went deep into Plato did. So did Aristotle, Socrates, and the rest of them. But the reason they did is because they had no concept of the spirit as the New Testament reveals it. And so the, you're a, you, are a, you, are, you are a spirit being from the Greek word pneuma. You have a soul from the Greek word psuche. We get the English word psychologist, study of the soul. And you live in a body. The Greek word for that is soma. You live in a body. You walked into this building this morning in a body. But make no mistake about it, your spirit, if you get down on your knees and cry out to God, can touch God. Amen. You can touch Him where He is. You're not touching Him from here, you're touching Him there. The Bible says our conversation, that's our manner of life, our, our being is not here. Where is it? Amen. It's there. And this is why I make such a big deal about the essence of the spirit. Nobody knows the essence of a spirit. Nobody can break the essence of a spirit down. It's not defined in the Bible. No way. You can't, you can't, you can't break down the essence of a spirit. Therefore, since you cannot break down the essence of a spirit, you cannot determine when a spirit can be where, how it travels, all of the things associated with a spirit, you can't do it. All you can do is take what the Bible says about it. So your body is a vehicle that you walked into this building in this morning that you will live in. And the Apostle Peter says, The Lord hath showed me how that I must shortly lay down this tabernacle, this flesh. That's what he said. The Apostle Paul said, I have a desire to depart from this body and to be with the Lord. Depart from the body. But Paul's still Paul. Once he departs from the body, he's still Paul. Amen. He's just not the body. He departs from it. And so to depart, to be absent from the flesh or from the body is to be present with the Lord. Amen. All right. Now... This is not a, you know, this morning it's not all about body, soul, and spirit, but I wanted to bring that back in because that's very important to understand as it relates to the new birth. The natural man has a soul, just like your soul, but his soul is not saved. The natural man's soul, he has intellect, emotion, and will, just like you do, but it's not saved. The natural man has a lost soul. Amen. But that Christian that is born again, and of course you can't be a Christian without being born again. That's redundant if anything ever was. But if a Christian, born again, born again believer, your spirit is born literally of the life of God. And the unsaved man has no concept of that. He has no connection with that. The Bible says he's an enemy of God. He can't receive the things of the Spirit of God. Foolishness to him, neither can he know them, for they're spiritually discerned. So you understand how that an unsaved world will only judge you by what you do? An unsaved world can only understand you by what you do. The words that come out of your mouth are meaningless if your life doesn't back it up. The unsaved man's criteria for judgment is simple. What he sees, what he hears, what he touches, what he smells, the five senses. That's it. As far as he goes, as far as he'll ever go. The unsaved man has no, uh, has no uh, uh, consciousness and understanding Spirit of God. But he can delve into the spirit world. The unsaved man can reach across the barrier that God has put within every individual on the face of this earth and begin to mess around with spirits in the spirit world and get himself in big trouble. He can become demon-possessed. He can, and he can call upon the powers of darkness and the powers of hell. First thing you know, he thinks he's in control, but he's nothing but a pawn. Right, right, the one in control is Satan. And the Bible warns us, if you're a Christian, you understand that. You know that you have an enemy. And you wrestle not against flesh and blood. And you, your wrestling is not with flesh and blood. It's with the spirit battle in the spirit world. And the closer you get to God, the closer Satan will draw to you. <laughs> 
That's just the way it is. There's no way to get around it. Soul, the spirit is pneuma. Soul is suke. Body is soma. There's another word used in the New Testament called sarke. And that refers to the flesh as Paul used it. The apostle Paul, when he talked about the flesh, he talked about it in a different sense than anybody else ever did. He talked about the flesh in the sense that it had its own mind, its own identity, its own feelings, its own will. When the Apostle Paul talked about the flesh, he talked about it in the sense that the flesh lusteth against the spirit. Didn't he? Well, now how can this physical soma body that has no feeling, how can it lust against the spirit? In other words, the Apostle Paul, who's the only man who ever opened up the Bible about the new birth, apart from the Apostle Peter, who said, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of the incorruptible, by the Word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Here's the Apostle Paul opening up the idea that the flesh has identity. It has a think. It thinks. It has, it, has, it has a spirit attached to it, the flesh. So therefore... The reason he said that is because a born-again believer has two natures. Amen. He has the new nature and the old nature. And the unsaved man doesn't understand that. The only thing he knows is the old nature. And so when the believer enters into this relationship with the Lord and realizes that on one hand he is a new creature in Christ Jesus, but on the other hand he knows that there's still an old spirit hanging with him, the old man. And so the, the Apostle Paul begins to teach you how to mortify the flesh, put to death the old man, and, have, and let the Spirit of God take control of your body. And the only way you can do it is through the Spirit. Amen. Asceticism won't do the job. You can lock yourself up in a building, lock yourself away from every temptation possible, but that will not make you spiritual. Right. won't do the job. The only way that you can overcome that old man, that old fleshly man, is by the Spirit. <laughs> And the only way that can be done is by humility and being able to receive from God what God's willing to give us, every one of us. And the apostle said, be not drunk with wine, where is an excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. To be filled with the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. Pray in the Spirit. Live in the Spirit. For your battle is not in flesh. Your battle is in spirit. You've got to be able to, to receive that and you've got to learn. Absolutely. And sometimes you, the only way to learn it is the hard way is that it takes the Spirit of God to overcome the old man. And, the, and there's no substitutes for it. So that's the new birth. Now the Latin had a term called animalis. And I think you could see what that's associated with. What do we call these creatures out here walking around, some of them on four legs and some of them 30 legs and what have you? We call them animals, don't we? Why do we call them animals? Why don't we call them human? Well, of course, we've got a group today that makes no difference between a human being and a dog. That shows how smart we are, doesn't it? We've come a long way. Amen. But uh, think about it for a minute. Since the Bible said God made man in his own image, it said he, ma it said he made man, not an animal. Amen. All right. Well, the, word, the term animal that we use in English came directly from Latin. And that Latin term is animalis. And it refers to a being that has life in it as far as it goes. A creature that has life in it, they call it an animal, you see. It's not necessarily a bad term. It's just a term referring to a creature that has life in it. But even the old Latin had enough sense to know that there was a difference between an animal and a human being. There's a difference, you see. He never refers to us as animals because there's a difference in us. There's a difference. You're born with that difference. It's inbred. It's innate to your character. You're born with that. You know to kill a man is far different than to kill a dog. Amen. Far different. Even though now they're writing laws and putting them on the books where it makes no difference. Amen. You, see how, you see how crazy and insane a human being can become? Even when it becomes the law, does it make it right? No. no. That's why the Lord Jesus gave the greatest wisdom this world has ever had or ever will had, have. Render to Caesar that which is Caesar's. And to God, that which is God's. Stick with that and you'll be all right. Amen. And when, re when Caesar reaches over and begins to pluck that which does not belong to him, remind Caesar that that's not Caesar's. Amen. And render to God that which is God's. And then according to the apostle in Romans chapter number 13, be subject to the laws of the land and live peaceably among all, all men, whether you're living under a king or a parliament or a, or a dictatorship 
or you're living under a republic, in a republic like this or wherever you're living, abide by the laws of the land. And that's, what, and that's why Christians have never been driven out of countries. Did you know that? But they've driven Muslims out and other religions. And the reason that Pakistan and, and, and India right now are just about to go to war is one simple reason. One simple reason. India is Hindu. Pakistan is Muslim. At one time, not too long ago, they were one country. But they could not live together. The Muslim cannot live with anybody. And so they, they, they created a country and called it Pakistan and filled it up with Muslims. And India, of course, is an old country. I mean old. It's as old as China. The, the culture is as old as China. And uh, the Hindus old. The Hindu religion far predates the Muslim. Far, far. By centuries it predates the Muslim. The Muslim didn't show up until about 600 A.D. when uh, Muhammad, uh, in a hundred years, overcame all of Europe, uh, all of the all of, uh, Middle East, rather, not Europe. He, thank God he was stopped by Charles Martel at the Battle of Tours in Europe. He was stopped, thank God. But uh, he, overcame, he overcame the Middle East, and, with, and by the edge of the sword, he rammed the Muslim faith down the throats of anybody if they didn't accept it off with their head. That's the way they convert. That's quite a way of evangelism. Amen. Think about it. <laughs> Go up and down withdraw. You're going to be a Christian? Whack! Off the head, buddy. And that's the way. You think I'm kidding you? Amen. No, sir, friend. Your problem is you listen to CBS, NBC, and ABC, CNN, Fox, and the rest of them. You're listening too much to the controlled media of this country. What I just gave you are facts. Facts. That's exactly how they evangelize. You convert or you die. And once they're in power, that's exactly the way they'll do it. And uh, in any event, let's get back to the animal. Amen. In Hebrews chapter number 2 and verse 7, it says this. Now, here's what I want to call your attention to. Look at John 3, 3. Except a man be born again, he cannot what? He cannot even see the kingdom of God. Now, this term kingdom of God is a very important term. Very important. Kingdom of God. Then there is another term in the New Testament called the kingdom of heaven. Now, there's a lot of good people, no doubt, a lot of good people who do not make a difference between the two and say they're interchangeable and there's no difference at all between them. Kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God essentially mean the same thing. No, they don't. I don't subscribe to that. I don't believe that. I believe the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are two entirely different things. I do believe at times they have run concurrently. I do believe at times they've been here together at the same time. For example... What you're reading in Hebrews, look carefully at the text. Hebrews chapter number 2 and verse 7. The Bible says that God crowned him. Let's go over here and read it. I don't have the whole thing on my notes, so I'll turn over to the text and read it with you. Hebrews chapter number 2 and verse 7. All right, now here's what it said. Hebrews 2, 7. Thou madest him. Now let's look at verse 6. What is man? that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man, that thou visiteth him. Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. A little. Then you crowned him with glory and honor, and did set him over the works of thy hands, and put all things in subjection under his feet. Now, what does that sound like to you? Does that sound like somebody that's been given a a, a, a sovereign sovereignty? Do you sound like somebody that's been given a kingship? A ruler? Absolutely. I mean, you don't talk about, you don't use terms like that for the president. He'll be gone four years or eight, or they may impeach him, throw him out in six months. Who knows? You use that term for a king, all right? A king over a kingdom. Do you know who he's referring to in Hebrews chapter number two? Who is the immediate context in Hebrews 2? Who, who do you think he's referring back to when you set him over the hands, over the works of thy creation? He's talking about Adam. The first Adam. Remember, there's two Adams. This is so important. This is so very important to remember this in this teaching that I'm, I'm giving out here. They are so close. The first Adam, last Adam. First man, second man. They are so very, very close. So close. The first man, Adam was made a living soul. The last Adam is the 
Lord from heaven, okay? But they're both Adams, all right? They're both placed over a kingship. The first Adam was placed over the earth. The Lord said, he said, have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air. Every place you put your foot, have dominion over it. That's your domain. Well, those are words for a king, a sovereign. So Adam was given a kingship. Now he being an innocent being, he being a being that was not fallen, therefore was qualified to be the king over the kingdom of heaven that God had placed on this earth. But he was also qualified uniquely to be the king over the kingdom of God because God was his Lord and God had given him a spiritual authority over this earth. So the kingdom of heaven, physical, and the kingdom of God, spiritual, Adam had God joined together both in Adam. But what did Adam do? He sinned. And what happened to him when he sinned? That's what we went on about at length. What happened to him in his nature, his being, body, soul, and spirit? When Adam sinned, nothing changed about his body. He lived on for 930 years. And so what happened? His spirit died. And remember, we made a big deal about this from Solomon, the book of Ecclesiastes, when he talks about the spirit going back to God who gave it. He's talking about the breath of life. The gift of life goes back to God who gave it. All right? He says that the spirit of life goes back to God it gave it. The spirit of the animal goes where? It goes down. It goes down. The spirit of man goes up. All right? So when Adam died, that... that uh, that life that he would, when the Bible says God made him in his own image, that image of God was body, soul, and spirit. Adam was body, soul, and spirit. And his spirit was perfect till he sinned. When he sinned, it died. The moment Adam's spirit died, Adam was no longer qualified to be the king of the kingdom of God. How could he be? He's dead. And so the Lord Jesus said, Nicodemus... You must be born again. You can't even see the kingdom of God. All from the first man, Adam, to the second man, Adam, were dead, born dead in trespasses and sins. Amen. Couldn't see the kingdom of God. Not a one of them. Weren't qualified. So when the Lord Jesus Christ shows up, He restores what Adam lost. Amen. This is why it says in Hebrews chapter number 1 that He was the express image of His person. And that word's only used one time in the New Testament in Hebrews chapter number 1. The word image, translated image, throughout all the New Testament, the word image is always translated from the Greek word icon. Icon, icon. You've heard of icons. But here in Hebrews 1, 3, the word translated uh, from the Greek word into, into the English word image shows up one time. You remember what that word was? That's exactly right. Character. 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 Lord Jesus Christ was, a, was an impression made in human flesh of the invisible God. Perfect in every sense of the word. To restore to mankind what the first Adam had lost. Jesus Christ is the second Adam. First Adam was the first man. Jesus Christ is the second man. See? God, two men, as far as God's concerned. First man, second man. All the rest of them fit under the first man or the second man. All right. So that brings us down to Hebrews chapter number 2. Since we have... What is man that thou art uh, mindful of him, and uh, the son of man that thou visiteth him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels, crownedest him with glory and honor, and didst set him over the works of thy hands. Put all things. Now look at verse number 8, and watch the way the Scripture does this. But now we see not all things put under him, but we see Jesus. Taking it from the first Adam to the last Adam who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. See how close they are? First Adam, last Adam, first man, second man. In plainer words, first Adam started a new world. Last Adam starts a new world. First Adam died, last Adam lives. First Adam lost it, last Adam regained it. Amen. The Apostle Paul right here, if Paul wrote Hebrews, whoever wrote it, is comparing the first Adam with the last Adam. That's what he's doing. See? We've got two Adams. The first Adam, last Adam, so close together and probably physically the appearance of the two would be hardly distinguishable. First man, Adam, was made a living soul. God breathed into his nostrils. He's the image of the living God. Adam was created in the image of God. Ever since then, man's been dying. 
but the last Adam restored what the first Adam lost. All right, so the kingdom of God has to do, therefore, with a spiritual kingdom. The Apostle Paul defines it. He tells you plainly in the Bible what the kingdom of God is. He says in 1 Corinthians 4, 20, the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. He said in Romans 14, 17, the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. And so, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven are very important. And we're not going to study all that today because I want to take you further. I want to show you something that's going on right now. Now, you live on the earth. <clears throat> the Bible says if you're unsaved, you're an earth dweller. You're an earth dweller. If you're saved, you're a pilgrim and stranger. You're, you're, you're an alien. You're a foreigner. The moment you were born again... You lost your uh, uh, citizenship to the earth. Amen. Sorry. <laughs> That's just the way it is. You're no longer a citizen of the earth. You're a citizen of heaven. Amen. So you're a, you're, you, 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 therefore, being a citizen of a foreign country, the apostle said in 2 Corinthians 5, we are ambassadors for Christ. Amen. See? The moment that that happened to you and that you're born again and your citizenship is in heaven, then we are representing a foreign country in the midst of a place where we were born naturally. But we are no longer natural. The Bible says we no longer know Him after the flesh. We're spirit beings. And so therefore we represent a foreign power, a foreign government, and a foreign country. We are ambassadors. We are ambassadors for Christ. That's what we are. That's our ministry. That's the ministry of a Christian. I represent somebody much higher than this earth. Amen. But the earth is the, uh, is the dwelling place of... Um, it belongs to... Satan. Here's what it says in Luke 4, verse 5. The devil, taking him up into a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. How in the world he did that amazes me. But Satan did it. And he did it in a moment of time. You know what that means? You can see that one of two ways. Either he showed him all of the current kingdoms of the world in a moment of time, or he showed him all of the kingdoms of the world from Adam to the coming of Christ. In a moment of time. Either way would fit the text. But the Bible says he showed them kingdoms of the world. In a moment of time the devil said to him. All this power will I give to thee. And the glory of them. Now listen to this. For that is delivered unto me. And to whomsoever I will. I give it. Jesus Christ did not rebuke him. In other words he didn't say you're a liar. He didn't say you're a liar. In other words it's not an idle boast. What he said was true. And he does still have the kingdoms of this world. Amen. The kingdoms of this world will not become the kingdoms of our Lord and His Christ till Revelation eleven fifteen, when it says the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and His Christ. This is why I'm premillennial. Because the church is not reigning over this earth now. God is not reigning over this earth now. At Christmas time, every year, the news media pounces on the word peace and talks as if the Bible has failed to bring peace to the earth. Jesus Christ said, I came to bring a sword. Amen. There will be no peace till the Prince of Peace is accepted in righteousness. And he will reign in righteousness. Amen. Amen. They rejected him, and when they rejected him, they rejected his peace. So he went back to heaven and says, My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you, but my peace I give to you. ABC, CBS, and NBC will never get that right. They won't get it right because they won't, they won't believe the Apostle Paul. You watch the news media quote the Bible, and 99 times out of 100, they'll quote Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. They will not quote Paul. They'll, they won't quote him. And the reason they won't is because the Apostle Paul carried on into the church age is where we are right now. Just check them out. They won't do it. So the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our Lord and His Christ. And when does that happen? Revelation eleven fifteen. Where are we now? We're 2,000 years into the church age. Regardless of what happens a month from now, you are living in an unprecedented time. You are. I hope you know that. In 1929, the stock market crashed. What happened back in 1929 has parallels today. But so much more is happening today than happened in 1929. You are living in unprecedented times. 
You're living in a time which may very well bring in the second coming of the Lord. He may do it. Now, we know that the kingdoms of this world right now are controlled by the power of hell. We know that. We know that uh, we wrestle not against uh, spiritual, uh, uh, against flesh and blood, but against principalities, power, spiritual wickedness in high places, so forth. Our battle is not with humankind. Our battle is with the spirit beings controlling this world. How do, how do they do that? How do spirit beings control the world? Well, what, how, did, how did a spirit being betray Christ? How did he do it? He used a man, exactly. He used a man. He entered into Judas Iscariot, the Bible says. He entered into Judas. He used him. He used a man. All right, so now how then is Satan going to hold on to the kingdoms of this world? He's going to do it through men. He's going to inspire men. He's going to raise up principalities. He's going to raise up powers. He's going to raise up governments. He's going to raise up kingdoms. And that's exactly what he's doing. You're watching right now the realignment of power. Amen. Don't know if you're aware of that. You're watching the realignment of power. Number one, the realignment of monetary power is happening right before your eyes. Amen. He that controls the purse strings controls the world. And all you have to do is observe what comes out of this, and you'll see what's going on. I don't know if I subscribe completely to the idea that all of this economic mess was, was, was uh, I know I don't, this. I, knew, I, I, I do not blame the Republicans for all this mess we're in. Not for a minute, and I hope you don't. I hope you're not that dumb. The Democrats had their part, too, make no mistake about it. It came from both sides of the aisle. But it, I believe it has far more to do than simply with politicians. I believe the economic mess we're in today can't all be blamed on Washington. I believe, some, I believe some forces are in play right now that's bringing about what's happening. Now, how many of you heard of a man named Albert Pike? All right. If you haven't, uh, all you have to do is type his name into the Internet and, and Google Albert Pike, and you'll have, you'll have enough to read for the next 500 years. <laughs> Plenty of material on Albert Pike. He was a Confederate general. And he was a brilliant man. These two things are without dispute. He was brilliant and he was a Confederate general. He was a graduate of Harvard. He was a lawyer. He was a lot of other things. He was also a grand, uh, uh, he was very high up in the Masonic Lodge. He wrote the morals and dogma of the Masonic Lodge. I have a copy of it. I've got two copies, matter of fact. I've got a copy at home and going through. What I'm trying to do with that copy is to see how he synthesizes all the religions of the world. All right, he did all of this. Now, let me say this right now. If you're a Mason, I'm not telling you that you're a Satanist, okay? And I'm not telling people that everybody that belongs to the, Sat to the Masonic Lodge is going to hell. Don't believe that for a minute. Don't believe it for a minute. The fact of the matter is, probably some good Christian people and, uh, who take the shirt off their back and give it to you and so forth. That's not the point. The point is, who's doing the thinking and what's going on, okay? Let the man speak for himself. Let him speak for himself. Here's what he said about the God of this world. Now remember this. This is important. When, Al when, when Albert Pike made a statement, he made that statement because he had done the research, he'd compared the material, he had, he, had, he had done exhaustive research into all of the religions of the world. He was a graduate of Harvard, so he knew how to do the job. And here's what he said about Lucifer. Direct quote, Lucifer, the son of the morning, is it he who bears the light and with its splendors intolerable Blinds, feeble, sensual, or selfish souls? Doubt it not. In other words, he presents it like this. He makes a statement by asking a question and then answers it himself. All right, that's the way he does it. All right, now this is all over the web that Albert Pike, uh, that, uh, uh, what did I say his name? Is it Albert Pike? Have I got that right? Yeah, yeah, Albert Pike said this. All right, now. In Isaiah chapter number 14 and verse number 12, Isaiah 14, 12, this word Lucifer shows up one time in your Bible. Isaiah 14, 12. One time. And 
Here's what it says. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? That's a Latin word. Son of the morning, how art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? All right. In the immediate context, verse 4, he's talking to the king of Babylon. All right. But things are said about this creature that cannot apply to an earthly king. All right. The Hebrew word in this text is not Lucifer. See, like I said to you a moment ago, that's a Latin word. The Hebrew word, which the Old Testament was written in, is Haleo. And that word means a bright and shining star or planet or object in the sky. All right? So therefore, the old Latin, because that's where this came from, which showed up in the first, second century after Christ, put the word Lucifer into the text as a translation because the Latin word Lucifer means light bearer or light brilliant one or shining one. So what we've got so far here now is this. Referring to the God of this world, he is a brilliant, light-bearing, shining object. That, there's, there's no dispute about that. And how could a brilliant, shining object in the sky be the king of Babylon? It can't be. What God is doing is saying to the king of Babylon, this is what you think you are, but there's a being much greater than you are. And there's something going on here that's much greater than you, King of Babylon. There is one that inspired you, and I'm going to deal with him. You, you, you follow me on that? When decisions are made and when things happen on this earth, it's happening because men have a certain spirit about them. There are people right now that would sell every one of you into slavery for the rest of your life for money and put it in their pocket and sit down at the table and order up a T-bone steak. There was a man in Austria that, that raped his daughter for 30-something years and kept her locked up in the basement and went out and lived a so-called normal life while he did this day in and day out to his daughter and never let her get out of there and see the daylight. You understand me now? That man right there had a spirit. He had a spirit. It is the spirit that energizes that man that we're going to deal with today. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against spirits. Our, when we walk in this house in here today, you come in here and you hear me preaching. I'm not going to preach you to wash your body. I'm not going to tell you to scrub up and think that's going to make you clean and holy. I'm not going to tell you to stop doing this and stop doing that and start doing this and start doing that like a lot of churches do and dictate verbatim every move and every place and everything that a person ought to go to make them holy. That's not going to make you holy. Amen. Your problem and my problem and everybody's problem on the face of this earth is the spirit that's in us. Amen. That's why the Lord Jesus says, don't whitewash the sepulcher. Go inside. Full, it's full of dead men's bones. The only way you're going to help a man is to change the spirit. Amen. And if you've got the spirit of Christ dwelling in you, then it's going to change the outside. So I'm going to deal with the spirits. And if anybody on the face of this earth ought to be qualified. I don't know why I'm getting into preaching now. I quit teaching. Now here I'm preaching. <laughs> but if anybody on the face of this earth ought to be qualified to deal with spirits, it ought to be the church. Amen. Us. Amen. Not the university. Not the secular government. The church. All right. So let's come back to Lucifer. Son of the morning. All right. That's quite a term. A bright morning star. Don't you think that's quite a thing? Lucifer. Did you know the NIV says it this way? I don't know if I carried that home with me or not, but I printed it out. Let's see if I've got it. The NIV. Anybody got an NIV with them this morning? You can read it from Isaiah. Nobody have one? We won't throw you up. Amen. Well, <laughs> here's what the NIV says. The NIV says he's the bright morning star. Okay? But the truth of the matter is, when you come to Isaiah chapter number 14, verse 12, Haleel, the Hebrew word, it means a bright, shining object in the heavens. So what have we done here? We're getting in trouble, aren't we? You know why? Turn to Revelation Chapter number 22 and verse 16. Now watch the way this thing works. Revelation 22 verse 16. 
I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify to you these things in the churches. All right. I am the root and offspring of David and the bright and morning star. All right, number one, accept it on face value. That's who he is. But why do he say that? <laughs> see, see the point? I am the bright and morning star. Not the one they're calling the bright and morning star. I am. And notice where it is. He finishes up the book. The book. The last chapter. I think that's the last verse, isn't it? More after that. I print this stuff. I, I think there may be. Yeah. Let's, I know it's a... Let's see here. Uh, 16. Yeah, there's about five more verses after that. Well, that's the last time he speaks. That's the last time he speaks in the Bible. And the last thing he says in the Bible. <laughs> I never thought about that before. Until just now. I knew why he did this. Why did he do this? He made the distinction, didn't he, brother? He said, don't mess yourself up with Latin and Hebrew and run around here with it. He said, I am the bright and morning star. Okay. So now when the NIV translators, and I didn't mean to get into this, but when the NIV translators called the devil that in Isaiah 14, 12, what are we getting into? Well, they say it's not the devil, of course. But what have they done? They've confused people. Amen. What did the King James translators do when they allowed the Latin translation and they used it? They could have used other words. Remember, King James translators are English. Yet they allowed the usage of a Latin translation. Lucifer is Latin. What did they do? Why did they do that? You've got to think with me in here. We're not, this is not uh, uh, a passive entertainment. <laughs> Why'd they do it? Somebody, you got an idea? Surely you have. Yes, they were, but I mean there's a reason for it, don't you think? Is there any way to confound Lucifer with Christ? No. Bright morning stars, you can get mixed up. See? Some say it's the star of Venus, and some say it's Saturn, it's this and that. You can get into all that stuff. That's not important. The important point is that the Hebrew term Hillel, which is Isaiah 14, 12, that term means a bright shining object in the sky, okay? Whether it be a star, planet, or what have you. So the old Latin translated that Lucifer. When they translated it Lucifer, they're making a decision here. They're saying something. They're, 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 they're taking that and saying, who are we talking about here in Isaiah 14? See, that's what they're doing. But the, but the NIV translators, here we are 2,000 years later almost, run back to that very same scripture and, and, and completely do away with the Lucifer of the Latin and go back and put bright morning star. And so the Lord shows up in Revelation 22 and says, I'm the bright and morning star. That's what I'm trying to say. I mean, Bear light and the source of light. There's two different things, isn't there? Okay. I got into a thing here yesterday. This guy. Uh, now, I'll give you this before we leave. We're, we're out of time, but Albert Pike is supposed to have predicted three world wars. We'll study them next Sunday morning. Three world wars. Number three is coming up. Now, this, he's alleged to have done this. We'll deal with that next Sunday. We've run out of time this morning. Okay? But I uh, lost my chain of thought. What was I going to say? Oh, yeah. He goes, he goes in long and hard about how that the King James Bible is a mistranslation. And it's just too bad you poor ignorant dummies believe your King James Bible because the word Lucifer is in there. Okay? And he's so much smarter than we are because he knows that it shouldn't be Lucifer. All right. What should it be?
Go ahead. Translate Haleo for us. What are you going to put in there? <laughs> Who's he talking about? What's going on in Isaiah 14, 12? See what I mean? There's nothing wrong with using Latin. Especially the old Latin. That's before Jerome's Latin. Vulgate showed up about the 4th century. There's nothing wrong with that. That's no mistranslation. That's talking about the devil. How could it be a mistranslation? It shows me that even the Latin translators back in the first century after Christ had enough sense to know who the devil was. Amen. Amen. All right, next Sunday morning, Sunday school, we're going to talk about the three world wars that Albert Pike predicted. The reason we're going to talk about that is because it has to do with the kingdom of God on this earth and what you're born into when you're born again. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that you'd use the study of your word. Bless your people. And be with us in the service to follow in a few minutes. In thy holy name I pray. And amen.